Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is a little program that's called The Farzy Show, presented by Stephen Singer of Stephen Singer Jewelers. Valentine's Day just around the corner. Uh, just saying is all. An eagle gets his car stolen. That's no bueno. Cowboys fans punching TVs. What else is new? And Ken Dunnick joins the show. Ken Dunnick, former Eagles tight end, played a couple of games for the Eagles, uh, was with them for longer than that, uh, helping them get ready for, I don't know, the Super Bowl in 1980. And since his, uh, and also played for the Philadelphia Stars. Ken is one of the nicest human beings you could ever meet. I met him, uh, geez, 10 years ago, I want to say. We were both doing an event together, hit it off, just a great guy. And I needed to get his uh, point of view on this Eagles team. I needed to get a comparison between him, uh, between Dick Vermeil, excuse me, his head coach there in the 1980 team, with the 1980 team, and Nick Sirianni. And I also wanted to get his take on Lane Johnson fighting his way through that game because it was absolutely incredible to see what Lane Johnson did. And I needed Ken's viewpoint on that. We got all that and more, but we're going to start it off with uh, two things. Number one, this is a phenomenal food city. Philadelphia is an incredible food city. I'm a big fan of any show Anthony Bourdain ever did. And when he came to Philly, I thought he did a wonderful job of highlighting all the great features of, of, of food in our city. Um, that show, Somebody Feed somebody feed Phil, if you haven't seen that, it's on Netflix. It's wonderful as well. He did a wonderful job of showing off Philadelphia. Was hanging out with uh, Mark Vetri. Was hanging out all over the city of Philadelphia. It was fantastic. We are a phenomenal food city. There is no way the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles should be eating Pizza Hut, should be eating Little Caesars, unless it's the very few and far between. I told you guys myself. What, last week when the news broke about Pizza Hut, I was like, you know what? I got a guilty pleasure. I like the Domino's thin crust for the pepperoni. The pepperoni is always really crispy. It's good. And maybe once a year I'll indulge and I'll have that because – but when you have all this great food around you, every once in a while, you, you want something that uh, is a layup, a little bit of a layup. It's nothing fancy, nothing special. It's something that anybody can get anywhere across the United States. And I'll go with that Domino's pizza. It is delicious. Um, but I've never gone from, let's say, Domino's to, let's say, Little Caesars in the following week or Pizza Hut the following week. That's usually my once, maybe twice a year type of indulgence. So in back-to-back -back weeks, the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles felt it necessary to uh, indulge in uh, a chain pizza place with all the phenomenal pizza we have in our neighborhoods and the phenomenal pizza we have in our area. I won't stand for it. Can somebody please help the Eagles? They're, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. And they got nothing. It's got nothing to do with the San Francisco 49ers, who now they're a two-and-a-half-point favorite over in the NFC Championship game on Sunday. But please send help. Please send help. Feed the Philadelphia Eagles. You know what? Maybe the maybe they just thrive on this kind of food. I mean, they played pretty well against the Giants after some stuffed crust pizza. So maybe, maybe you know, maybe maybe they're onto something here. Maybe maybe a little uh, five dollar uh, ready box, whatever the hell they have at that Little Caesars. That that commercial is so damn catchy. Maybe this is all they really needed. Maybe this is all they really needed. I don't know. What do I know? Uh, but anyway, Ken will help us try to get them some food, I guess, when he joins the show coming up a little bit. I have seen the video of the Cowboys fan punching the TV. Can, in the world of DVR, can we all agree that this is all, this is all just, this is all for show, right? When I saw the Cowboys fan watching the TV, I, I said to myself, this is not real. I don't believe you. And here's the simple reason why. You're not having that many friends over to watch a game on, what is it, a 27-inch TV? You're not doing that. You're not fooling anyone when, when, when you're punching that TV. And the reaction to me, I just thought was staged. And I think this has become a thing nowadays where you just want to get clicks, you want to get retweets, you want to get likes, you want to get views. And you're putting things like this on, on the old internet there, and it's going to catch up with a firestorm. I don't know, probably a million views when you combine all the different outlets that actually picked it up uh, of this Cowboys fan jumping up on the final play of the Cowboys 49ers game. That was an absolute dud of a play. You're probably, in that scenario, going back and just showing off 
putting on a show, whatever it might be. But bottom line is, it still shows a frustrated Cowboys fan. So real or not, I'll take it. Because they might not have been TV smashing angry. They still were angry is the bottom line to that. So I'll still enjoy it. But I will just say they call BS on that. Uh, now let's get to some nitty gritty here. The uh, Philadelphia Eagles and San Francisco 49ers kick off 3 o'clock Sunday in the NFC Championship game. Uh, there has been a, a deep dive of some media members here with Brock Purdy and Jalen Hurts and their history, and I find this fascinating. Back in November of 2019, when uh, Jalen Hurts was a member of the Oklahoma Sooners and uh, Brock Purdy was a member of Iowa State, right? Iowa State. They clashed in an epic battle. 42-41 was the final score in favor of Jalen Hurts Sooners. And in that game, they combined to throw for eight touchdowns apiece. And Oklahoma, of course, won a, walked away with that victory. Uh, you had uh, Jalen Hurts throwing to C.D. Lamb in that game. It was an incredible battle. The o Oklahoma ran up a, a big score. Uh, you had Brock Purdy and Iowa come, Iowa State coming back, fighting back in that game to make it. They, it came down to a two-point conversion in an epic battle, and they weren't able to convert uh, on that play, so the, uh, the Sooners walked away with the victory. But now, just a couple of years later, and I also found this interesting, this is the youngest matchup in the NFC Championship game in the history of the NFC Championship game between quarterbacks. Take a listen to this. Names like Mark Malone and Dan Marino in 1984. John Elway, Bernie Kosar. All right. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes just in 2020. Those two, Patrick Mahomes and uh, Josh Allen, getting this by way of ESPN, 50 years old and 12 days combined ages of quarterbacks okay facing each other in the conference championship game now brock purdy and jalen hurts on sunday will become the youngest pairing of quarterback to face each other in a conference championship game at 47 years old and 208 days that is something young youth experience at that level is unbelievable when you think about these young guys and the start they're getting to their careers especially Jalen Hurts because Brock Purdy I mean yes you go to the NFC Championship game with him as your quarterback but you won with Jimmy Garoppolo Trey Lance obviously is still has a lot to prove there but how if you're Kyle Shanahan can you walk away from what you were able to accomplish with Brock Purdy as your quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo has played himself in a Super Bowl it'll be tough but the clear cut franchise guy is our guy in Jalen Hurts. And listen to Nick Sirianni at his press conference yesterday. Back up the Michael Jordan uh, comparison. Back up the fact that that's the type of leader Jalen Hurts is here in Philadelphia. Back up the fact that that's the kind of calming presence a team has when you look over and you see a guy like Jalen Hurts is your leader. It's, a, it's the comparison he felt he needed to go after. Michael Jordan. He stuck with it yesterday. And he also talked about how when this team needs a rally, when this team needs somebody to look at, I saw uh, Darius Slay talk about this after the game, after the Saturday's game as well, that when you have Jalen Hurts back there, especially like that game against the Colts, and that's the game Darius Slay referenced, when you have Jalen Hurts back there, you just feel like you're going to win because you got that guy. You got that guy. That is every elite quarterback in the NFL, every elite quarterback, what they inspire in the team, that you always have a chance to win the game. And I remember all the quarterbacks we've watched, all the great quarterbacks we've watched. Even if you even go back to that one year, God forbid, with Carson Wentz 2017 when he was healthy and the Eagles were just dominating, you always felt like you had a chance to win. The week before Carson Wentz got hurt and Nick Foles took over in Los Angeles, the week before that they were in Seattle. And I remember I was there. It was a Sunday night game, and the Eagles did not have they did not play their best game. They played one of their worst games. But in that game, I always felt like they had a chance to win the game because Carson Wentz was playing at that high level. Jalen Hurts right now. All the quarterbacks we've got, Patrick Mahomes, we've watched this year, Josh Allen, we've watched this year, Joe Burrow, we've watched this year. All the great quarterbacks we've watched just this year alone. Jalen Hurts is right there and always letting your team feel like you have a chance to win. 
always letting your fan base feel like you have a chance to win. Even in their worst game of the season this year against the Washington Commanders, you felt like they had a chance to win the game, and they did have a chance to win the game because of their quarterback, Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts throws deep down the middle of the field to Quez Watkins, drops it, fumble. Throw a perfect pass to Dallas Goddard. He catches it. Face mask, fumble. You still like it. You still felt like up until maybe that point, you had a chance to win because Jalen Hurts was your quarterback. That's what great quarterbacks are supposed to do. And this was a great season by Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts was a great quarterback this year. Now, if it comes to all-time greats, when it comes to looking back on this team 10 years from now, great quarterback and all that, that will remain to be proven. But, man, he has certainly got what it takes to become one of those great quarterbacks. He is an elite quarterback right now in the NFL. He played this season at an elite level. He played this season, oh, geez, what, 15-1, and 14-1 and one in games that he started? 15-1. and one. That's pretty damn good. Elite quarterback. If you, if you want to break it down to comparing it to, in my opinion, the greatest basketball player I've ever seen play, I can tell you that right now, in Michael Jordan, that's, that is high praise. And if you want to break it down and say that that type of impact you can have on a locker room, how you can have on your team, is that inspiring to them to always make them feel like they're going to win? Or they at least have a chance to win? Yeah, that's in, that's inspiration. And that's talking about a guy that I think it's, it's an accurate thing when you talk about Jalen Hurts and the inspiration he can give to a team. But it's also pretty accurate to talk about how great and elite he played the position of quarterback this year for the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles are going into that game on Saturday, as I, or excuse me, on Sunday. Now they got me backwards. Uh, on Sunday, uh, as two-and-a-half-point favorites. Jalen Hurts is going to be that difference, as I was telling you yesterday, and we'll get into it with uh, Ken Dunn coming up in just a minute. But I was absolutely amazed uh, by what I saw really throughout this season from Jalen Hurts. To hear that comparison from Nick Sirianni, and then to hear him back it up again yesterday in uh, the press conference, I thought, hey, it's working for this team. It's working for this team. A couple other things that came out uh, yesterday uh, were this is no surprise because the man's name has been uh, mentioned and brought up every time we talk about how great a year this was for this Eagles defense. Vic Fangio. If Jonathan Gannon is hired as a head coach elsewhere, the Eagles are expected per report, Ian Rappaport, NFL.com, NFL Network, Put it out there saying that the Eagles are expected to make a heavy push for Vic Fangio to be their next defensive coordinator. I know a lot of Eagles fans would be thrilled to get Vic Fangio as a defensive coordinator. I would be thrilled to get Vic Fangio as, their def as the Eagles defensive coordinator. But I feel like it is important to still recognize the fact that this has been one of the greatest Eagles defensive seasons ever. And yes, this team has guys like Buddy Ryan in their past who had things up. They have guys like Reggie White who had things up. But even with Reggie, they didn't get the sack totals that they got this year. It, it That's a lot. I mean, we're talking about high praise. That is high praise. But it's a statement of fact when you look at the numbers and how they performed to the B, the number one seed. What? It's pretty impressive. Jonathan Gannon has headed this team up on the defensive side of things and led them to that incredible season. And Howie Roseman has done a phenomenal job. It's wild to me to think about this defense being top 10 again for the second straight year and better than that in most categories this year in points, in yards, now being up there with turnovers, takeaways, I should say, now being up there in sacks, which was not a thing last year. And it's like the person we give the least amount of credit to is the defensive coordinator himself. If you were to give, in all honesty, answer this question, please, in the chat. Hit me up. Let me know. If you were to give credit for why this team was so great defensively this year, Jonathan Gannon might be, at best, the third person to give credit to in all of this. I think the number one person is Howie Roseman. Then I think people will look at Vic Fangio and go, he had a lot of influence on the scheme. And then people will go maybe and focus back on the players and say, well, Hassan Reddick just had a monster year and everybody else was able to feed off of that, which is true as well. But Howie Rosen brought in Hassan Reddick, but I still think people would mention Hassan Reddick. And then maybe fourth, they would mention the defensive coordinator, Philadelphia Eagles, who Nick Sirianni just put his neck out there defending in his press conference on Saturday night, saying he's going to be a head coach in this league and people need to respect Jonathan Gannon. He's a great, great coordinator. 
as you know is how great this defense has been all year long. He might get fourth <laughs> in the chain of credit. <laughs> number one's probably Howie for putting the defense together and getting players and all that stuff. And then number two might be Vic Fangio for uh, his influence. And number three might be Asad Reddick for the monster year that he's had. And then number four might be Jonathan. Yeah. In the eyes of the public, that's the belief, that's the way I believe it would go down. For me, all honesty, it goes Howie Roseman is number one for credit. Hassan Reddick, even though how he got him, but Hassan still had that incredible season. And then it goes Jonathan Gay. I will, I will at least acknowledge what I think is Vic Fangio being number four, which would be just a little bit of influence, a little bit of influence, a little bit of influence. Never officially a consultant for this defense, but definitely ideas and schemes that he would like to run when he was with the, uh, whether it was to be the Broncos or whether it was be when he was defense coordinator of the 49ers when they went to the Super Bowl with Colin Kaepernick and the lights went out. And all that, uh, as the Ravens came back and won. Uh, but that's it, uh, it, it, it is an interesting thing. It is an interesting thing. I go uh, number three right there uh, because I think he did a lot of the same thing. He did make adjustments. The reason I don't put him below Vic Fangio is because he, I I did see this Eagles defense run a hell of a lot more games than I saw them run a year ago. Uh, I saw this defense actually blitz a linebacker or two. Uh, I saw a guy like uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson come in here and play, I thought, at an elite level as a safety, and now continuing the elite level of play that he's had as a nickel corner. So I, I, I've i been amazed with how you've been able to use these guys that have been brought in by Howie Roseman. When you have a 16-and-a-half sack season, when you have a 16, 18-sack season, including the playoffs now, Hassan Reddick, I got to give a lot of credit to that player especially when that player has been asked by the defensive coordinator to drop back in coverage every once in a while. But it's crazy to think of the numbers that the Eagles were able to put up defensively. And you would think in this town, oh, this defensive coordinator is incredible. No. In this town, I never thought I'd see a day where people would look at Howie Roseman with more adulation, with more admiration than they would the defensive coordinator of one of the top defenses in the NFL and the sack leaders of the NFL. Never thought I'd see the day. Yet, here we are. People love Howie a hell of a lot more than they love Jonathan Gannon. It's amazing to think about. By the way, when I was on um, CBS3 Sunday nights, uh, Don Bell asked me the question about... Um, Nick Sirianni and what he had to say about Jonathan Gannon and how he had to defend him to people in the media uh, that rip him. And I told uh, Don this question. This this comes up a lot, actually. One of the things I hate the most about doing this is that you got to be brutally honest. And, and that's mean sometimes. You got to be mean. I consider myself a halfway decent person. And I don't. I consider myself a nice guy. I don't like saying mean things um, about people. I don't like calling people out on mistakes and all that stuff, but that's part of the gig, right? So if someone was to come at me, and people do on social media, I mean, it's, I'm not uh, exempt from that. You know, everyone th deals with that that cracks open a microphone. I'm not saying I'm special. But every time somebody does, I go, okay, all right. There might be some truth there, or there might not, whatever. I don't. Try, I try not to get offended by it, right? Usually it depends on how much sleep. If I'm cranky, sometimes I'll get pissy about it. But anyway, uh, but if people uh, that play for these teams if people that coach these teams, people that own these teams, people that are in the front office of these teams, if they want to throw a little fire back in the direction of the media, I got no problem with that. I just, I got no problem with it. Uh, I have a problem when you want to make it somebody else's press conference. Cause I always remember in a uh, good old journalism school at Temple university, they always said no dialogue. If they ask you a question, maybe answer it as quickly as possible, but it's not your press conference. You're not the star of the show. Don't be the story. Report on the story, right? And I always thought those were words to live by, and I've, for the vast majority of my career, I've lived by those rules. So if they want to call us out, if they want to call out uh, the talking heads, if you will, I have no problem. They want to throw critiques back at, pe at people who literally make a living on forming critiques. I'm fine with that. Good for them. And Nick Sirianni saying what he said, good for him. That's fine. Other players that want to talk about it, fine. I remember asking Doug Peterson 
uh, the year after it was the, on the way to the Super Bowl. And he was talking in the press conference. And I think I've told this story before on the air. But we were in the press conference. Lane Johnson was walking around in a dog mask. Everyone else was walking around in a dog mask on the field. It was awesome. And Doug Peterson's in the press conference after they won the NFC Championship game uh, against the Vikings about how, uh, you know, we don't listen to the outside noise. It's all about what goes on in that locker room. We don't hear what goes on. He got asked the underdog question, whatever. And Doug said, yeah, we don't listen to that. It's all about what goes on in, the, in those walls over there. And I just remember thinking, bull, you know what? And I got the next question in. I jumped on it. And I just go, I go, Doug, you say that. But right now, Lane Johnson's walking around in a dog mask. All right. Like, you guys have to use that as motivation. And Doug, I'll never forget it, stares me down. And goes, when did when did Carson go down? And he looks, and he looks, and he looks at me. And I'm like, against the Rams. And he goes, since then, no one gave us a chance. Nobody gave us a chance. And then he went on this beautiful, like voiceover quality for a wonderful underdog movie story about what it meant to this team to overcome the idea of losing uh, the, the MVP of the league at that point, the backup coming in, the defense rising to the occasion and all that stuff. Nobody gave us a chance. And he gave us this whole thing. And I, uh, this, is where I, this is where I shut up, all right? Because he was so eloquent. I didn't say a damn thing. It was beautiful. But when he said, nobody gave us a chance, I was actually, I gave him a chance. <laughs> I remember being on the radio the next day and actually it was Al Morgani and I that were acting like, uh, they're, they're not out of this. They can still, they got, they're going to get the number one seed. They're going to get a home field advantage. They got a great defense. Nick Foles can win. Nick Foles did have a 27 and two season in terms of interceptions and touchdowns in the Chip Kelly year. They did go to the playoffs that year. They got a chance here, especially with this defense. You're throwing to Alshon Jeffrey. Yeah, the Tory Smith, he had a good offense. Zach Ertz, he had a good offense. That running game, that offensive line, he had a good offense. I gave him a chance. A lot of people gave him a chance. I was one of them. Anyway, but I, that's an example of, yeah, he wants to throw critiques. Oh, you guys didn't give us a chance. I, I could have said, I said, coach, I, I gave you a chance. It's just it's while we're here, while we're all gathered. Anyway, uh, but it was a beautiful thing. It was absolutely a beautiful thing. But if they want to throw critiques and uh, a little criticism our way, have at it. Uh, all is fair, man. All is fair and love, war, and sports talk, apparently. Um, so, yeah, there, there you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, all right. I want to make sure we get uh, we, we get Ken in here because I, I just think Ken's an awesome guy. Uh, so I want to get that conversation going here. And for you people that don't know about the Philadelphia Stars, okay, just sit back. And I asked Ken's the last thing we talk about because it's just awesome talking about that team. Uh, we'll get to that in this interview as well. But right now, let me tell you about Steven Singer. Of Steven Singer, Jewelers, the other corner of Nathan Walnut, right there on Jewelers Row. For over 40 years, Steven Singer's been in the love business in Philadelphia, helping people get engaged and fall in love. And right now, Valentine's Day is right around the corner. So do yourself a favor. Get out there now to Steven Singer, Jewelers, the other corner of Nathan Walnut, and take advantage of the perfect price each and every day. Steven Singer Jewelers, one place, one price, the perfect price. Now, what's the perfect price? The perfect price, simple. You know why people say, I hate Steven Singer? You know who says that? Most of the other jewelers. That's who says it. Because Steven offers that perfect price where you don't, he doesn't mark things way up just to mark it down a couple of bucks in front of you and make it feel like, oh, you're a real good negotiator. No. Steven Singer Jewelers, one place, one price, the perfect price online at IHateStevenSinger.com. That's IHateStevenSinger.com. Let me tell you guys right now about the great people of Manscaped. Manscaped.com, get 20% off and free shipping with Manscaped.com when you use promo code Farzi. That's promo code Farzi at Manscaped.com. You'll enjoy the Platinum Package 4.0, which includes their amazing, amazing, and their best hygiene uh, bundle yet. They both come with skin safe technology, the Lawnmower 4.0 uh, the trimmer, as well as the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer. And they come with skin safe technology that helps reduce the risk of, uh, helps reduce the risk of nicks. So you can manscape with confidence and comfort. Go to manscaped.com, 20% off and free shipping when you use promo code FARZY. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's jump on the Rothman Orthopedics guest, uh, guest line and talk to our guest today, Mr. Ken Dunnock, about all things Eagles.
us right now on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you read Jer- Jersey Man magazine, if you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan, Philadelphia Stars fan, and just a fan of all around good people, Ken Dunnick joins the show, ladies and gentlemen. What's going on, Ken? Hey, Mark, great to see you, man. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Absolutely, man. It's great to see you and talk to you as well. Now, first off, let's just, in a matter of emergency here, Nick Sirianni continues to have uh, Pizza Hut. He continues to have now Little Caesars is the latest one. Yeah. All that great food, especially over there in South Jersey, Vito's Pizza and all that stuff, man. Can we get this guy some good food? Can we get this guy some decent food? Let me tell you something. I guess it's the way coaches do because it was Doug Peterson with the ice cream, this guy with the pizza. You know, back then – we were lucky to get a dry chicken sandwich in between practice. So it's a little bit different today in today's NFL. But I'm happy for these guys. They deserve it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Ken, after your football career, you went ahead and founded and uh, published Jersey Man magazine. You have expanded. You're now actually – you're in Miami, which is why it's so beautiful and sunny in the room that you're in right now. we got the overcast here in Philly. Uh, exactly. it's rough. Take me through the process real quick of, uh, of all that went into Jersey Man magazine. Well, listen, you know, 11 years ago, we decided to uh, develop a magazine featuring men's content, not to be exclusive of women. I got four daughters and a wife. They would kill me if there's anything bad in the magazine. So women seem to love the magazine. But uh, we thought there was an opportunity to develop a magazine featuring sports, wine, cigars, politics, business. And, And we were successful to the point where we decided to launch another market. So Boston Man Magazine is now four years old. We're a developing Miami man, and that's why I'm here with you from Fort Lauderdale. I got the Frank Costanza cruise wear on right now with the deck <laughs> shoes, and I'm looking good in my in my Florida condo as I uh, get ready for a Miami man party tomorrow night. So we're pretty excited. About you look like a million damn dollars, my right. friend. Uh, absolutely. Uh, now, I, I got to ask you a couple of things here. Now, you played on the offensive line. You played tight end for the Eagles. You were on the Eagles' uh, 1980 uh, Super Bowl team, of course. Right. Uh, I, I got to ask you about Lane Johnson first and foremost. I asked Clay Harbor a similar question, but playing with the injury that, that that Lane Johnson played with, could you imagine trying to tough it out for that amount of time throughout that game against that Giants defensive line to help this team win in the playoffs? It's hard to believe, really, because I've had that injury. I've had the abdominal strain, and it's incredibly painful. You have to be a warrior to do what he's doing. And I specifically watched him from series to series the other night. And you could tell he's about 70 to 75 percent. But even at that percentage rate, he's still better than most right tackles are in the league. His reach and his ability to keep defenders off of him is amazing. And the fact that he's out there doing it for the team is just uh, incredible. What a teammate. Mm -hmm, Certainly. And I have to ask you about the maturation process of Jalen Hurts because we went into the offseason all about, is he the guy? Do you believe in Jalen Hurts? Whatever. I mean, he's given – every reason for this franchise to make him the franchise quarterback. But I, I've asked everybody this question that's been on the show. What, what Was there a moment that clicked for you that made you go, wow, Jalen Hurts is the guy going forward. Like he has really put it together in this one off season. Is there a moment this year that you look back on going, yeah, this that's the moment that it clicked for Jalen Hurts? You know, there was, and I'm trying to remember, I went to the Giants game at the link last year and I had an end zone seat. And you could actually tell he was having trouble with his progression. Because of the time he's put in the facility, and you're reading the same things I am, the guy's there and he never leaves. He's the first one there. He's the last one to go out. And when you study like that and you prep your body like that and you train, obviously he had a baseline of talent that could uh, help make him successful. But his maturation process, and I even think his arm strength is better than it was last year. So, you know, he checks all the boxes for me now. He's going to be paid. The Eagles might as well write the check for two or three hundred million right now because that's what's going to take to keep him. In. And he deserves it because he's the man. He's paid the price, and he's now the Eagles' quarterback. I got to ask your take on Nick Sirianni because I would go ahead and describe Nick Sirianni as a rather emotional head coach. You played for a rather emotional head coach in Dick Vermeil. Do you see similarities between the two in their coaching styles? Uh, I do. I think they're uh, they're both uh, good people, number one. And Dick Vermeil has uh, lucky enough to call him a friend for the last 40 years. As a matter of fact, I just had dinner with him last week. And he's as vibrant an 86-year-old man as you're ever going to see. But I think uh, Nick Sirianni is a uh, well-schooled football coach. I think he's a good person. I think he lays it all out there for his team to see emotionally and say what you want to about that. Players buy into that. If they see the coach emotionally 
involved with the team and passionate and doing the game plan and up late at night. Uh, that's created a really healthy environment. So I, I, I love Sirianni. I think he's, uh, again, he's a guy that's improved his game this year. I love his aggressiveness. He goes, you know, for a lot, just like Doug Peterson, which is the way of the NFL right now. So, yeah, I'm very happy with Nick's progression. When you go back to the introductory press conference of Nick Sirianni, a lot of people were ready to just pack it in right then and there and say, this guy ain't it. And then you advance to the flower power speech that he had in this locker room last year. And everyone, everyone that might have been, all right, let's give him a chance, might have been like, no, nah, I don't think so. We're out on this guy. That seemed to rally the locker room around this guy. And, He's not a player. He did not play in the NFL. But somehow he was able to connect with a lot of these athletes and get them to buy in in a very similar way to a guy like Doug Peterson who did play in the league. What do you think was the key to him being able to identify and lock in with this locker room? Well, you don't have to play to be a great coach. Bill Pelichek, to my knowledge, never played in the NFL. He may be the greatest NFL coach in history. So I I really think it's all about sincerity. I think uh, the players feel that from Nick and – they thrive on it, and they bought in. You get In a locker room today in the NFL, you've got to get players to buy in. That team has bought in on Nick Sirianni and his staff, and you know, hopefully it'll lead to a Super Bowl championship. I mean, could you? I don't know what your prediction was, what you expected from this Eagles team, but how far did they reach above what you expected them to do this year? Well, early on, I expected them to win the division because I thought the division was relatively weak. Uh, I was uh, happened to be wrong because uh, so many teams from the NFC East wound up making the playoffs. But uh, Dallas was a good team, but I thought the Eagles were uh, a step ahead. And I really thought <clears throat> the Eagles preseason had a chance to go to the Super Bowl. As the game, as the season progressed, I was more and more convinced that this was the best Eagles team that I personally have ever seen. As you know, I do a podcast with uh, Mar- uh, Mark Eckel, and uh, we had. Coach Dick Vermeil on a couple weeks ago and Ray Didinger when, when Mark was struggling with a health issue. And uh, we were all uh, in agreement that this is the best, deepest Eagles team that we have ever seen. I think it's better than 2017. I think it's better than the 1980 team or the 2004 team. So I really do believe that this team is is, uh, is stacked up to make a, a, a deep run and hopefully they'll win this week and go on to the Super Bowl. The, the one guy I think about when everyone talks about you never know when it's going to be the last game, you never know when these guys are going to play together again, is I think it's obvious is Jason Kelsey. And I think you, you look at this guy, a five-time All-Pro, you talk about him as a Hall of Famer. Him as a leader, him as the undersized center that he came out of Cincinnati as and what he has built his career into. When you look back at Jason Kelsey as an O-lineman, as a center of this football team, what really jumps out to you about his career here in Philly? I think he's the best center uh, that the Eagles have ever had. I think that his ability to pull is unlike any center I've ever seen. He's he's definitely going to be a Hall of Famer in my eyes. Uh, I believe that he's going to go down you know, with, with Jim Otto and Stevenson and some of these other centers that have made the Hall of Fame. And, uh, and I really love, again, a guy who's passionate. This guy is Philly true and true, right? The, the speech, uh, the day of the uh, victory parade, you know, locked everybody into Jason Kelsey. And he's another guy that's emotional and sincere and passionate about the Eagles. And uh, that's the perfect scenario for an Eagles fan to, to tie into a guy like that. for sure. Can you describe for people what it's like to be a member of the Eagles when you're, when you're going in a deep run and you got the crowd behind you, the support of the Philadelphia fan base, can you describe to people what that's like as a player? Well, for me, my Eagles career was, uh, was such a lark. You know, I didn't, play high school football. I was a basketball player at Memphis State and wound up trying out for the football team, had a good run, and then had some free agent offers coming out of college and chose the Eagles uh, primarily because because of Dick Vermeil. And as it turned out, uh, Keith Crefley and John Spagnola got hurt in preseason. I got to play significant uh, minutes in a couple preseason games, and they saw enough to keep me. Luckily, it was the year that we go to the Super Bowl in 1980. So uh, for me, every day being an Eagle was a really special experience. The fact that I was on that team that went to the Super Bowl, we go down to New Orleans, I'm practicing, I'm helping the team prepare, and uh, having been a small part of that team, I could tell you there's nothing like it. Having success in Philadelphia is the best because fans want their team to care as much as they do. And, and if you can prove to them – that you do care as much as they do, they're all in, baby. And, uh, say what you want to about Eagles fans, but 
if they know you care, if they're right behind you. Uh, I do have to ask you a question about the defensive side of the ball here because they've had such an incredible year. Really, Hassan Reddick has been the guy that has jumped off the page when just looking at the stat sheet this year from the Eagles and you talk about all the sacks that he himself was able to acquire this year and then the defense as a whole. Just what have you made of this defense overall with how they've really approached this season? Uh, I think Howie's done a good job of building this defense. The defensive line is stout. I did a, a, a Temple SMU game, I believe, a few years ago when Hassan Reddick was playing for Temple. And I made mention during the telecast, and I believe Hassan Reddick at that time was playing linebacker at about 195 pounds. And I said, if this kid can put on 20 more pounds, he's got the motor and the talent. To me, it looks like a mini Lawrence Taylor. And that's exactly what's happened. He's a first-round choice. Why the Cardinals gave up on him, I'll never know. But he comes in here, brings his talent home, and he's just, you know, his motor along with Brandon Graham and all these guys. It's hard to pick out a guy, you know, Sweat's playing well. Uh, we, we've got a really good defensive uh, team. Our linebackers are stepping up. Bradbury defensively slay these guys can play in the backfield. So it's a complete defense, really fun to watch. Uh, you, uh, I, I got to get your prediction, your early prediction. We're taping this on Monday. It'll air on Tuesday's show. So when you when you look at this San Francisco 49ers team, the win they had against the Cowboys and all that, by the way, does, do, do you just always, is, is it so ingrained to you to not like Dallas? Is that how it works? Does it just never leave you? Hey, listen, I was rooting for Dallas to win so we could beat them again. So I, I guess it does, right? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing yeah, like beating yeah, Dallas, especially you go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> I watched that Wilbur Montgomery clip of his run on the, in the 80 championship game over and over. It's one of my favorite moves. <laughs> so it never does leave you. Uh, no. when, you, when you do look at the San Francisco 49ers team, what are you expecting to come out of championship Sunday with the Eagles and Niners? I think it's going to be a good game. I think the Eagles are a better team, and at home they should win the game. Uh, I believe that uh, Brock Purdy has, has played incredibly well up to this point. Um, as a matter of fact, I thought it may have been his worst game uh, this past weekend, and it wasn't a bad game. It was just, you know, Dallas. It was it was basically a defensive game, that, uh, as as it turned out. But uh, he, he's a nice young quarterback. I think uh, his eyes are going to be pretty wide open when he comes to Philly, playing a team that's got a chance to go to the Super Bowl. So we're going to throw everything we have at him. But I, I said it before, and I, I said it prior to this week. I like the Eagles to go to the Super Bowl. I see the Eagles winning this game by seven to ten points. And, uh, boy, it's going to be exciting. And hopefully we'll have another parade in our future. I, I would certainly hope so as far as the AFC goes. Uh, you got the Chiefs. You got, you got the Bengals. Uh, who are the Eagles going to face? Uh, in I'm, I'm going to go because of the Mahomes injury. I'm going to go with Cincinnati. I think Joe Burrow is a, is a rising star. He's probably a top three quarterback at this point. I do think that the, uh, if anyone's had a high ankle sprain, it's much more serious than it sounds. I mean, it can be uh, totally debilitating. I've had them, and it's, it's even hard to walk on it. So he's going to get 24-hour treatment trying to get ready for this game. But I don't think he'll be as effective as a quarterback, and that's pushing me to, uh, to put uh, Cincinnati in Super Bowl. I, I got to ask you, okay, so Eagles and Bengals in the Super Bowl, love it. All right, now uh, – I have to ask you this because I need to go and have a little bit of a history lesson here because as a member of the Philadelphia Stars, you look at the roster on that team and it doesn't get talked about enough, Ken. Just talk about your experience with that team, please, and the guys that you were able to play with there. It was, again, another special experience. I think the Stars and the Eagles would have been a great game back then for people who don't remember. We had guys like you know, Sam Mills, Hall of Famer, Kelvin Bryant, one of the greatest running backs ever. You've got William Fuller, who went on to a great career uh, with the Eagles. Bart Oates, who was a all-pro center with the Giants, won multiple Super Bowls. Sean Landetta was the punter. David Trout, the ex-Steeler, was the kicker. And, you know, Chuck Comiskey went on to play for the Saints. Every player, significant player for the Stars, went on and either played in the NFL prior or had substantial minutes after. So having been on both teams, I can tell you that that w is a game that everybody would have wanted to see because it would have been a really good and, and, and who was your coach? Jamora. <laughs> it's no, so amazing. No, it's no, incredible. No, we're not going to do. We're not going to do the playoffs no, thing, no, are we? No, no, no. Okay. I wouldn't do that. No, I, I, I wouldn't do that to you. Don't you worry. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Ken, so great catching up with you, my friend. Really great catching up. Congratulations on all the success of Jersey Man Magazine, of Boston Man Magazine, of uh, obviously now Miami Man Magazine. I mean, whatever gets you to Miami, I guess. Fun in the sun, right? Uh, so hey, good exactly. for you, man. 
exactly. My, hey, Mark, I'm a big fan of the show, and uh, you know I've known you for a long time, and continued success, my friend. I enjoyed being on. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much. The great Ken Dunnick joining us here on the Rothman Orthopedics Guest Line. Ken, great catching up. Thanks again. All right, take care, my friend. Ken's the best. Ken's the absolute best. Love talking to him, man. And the, this, the names he was rattling off there with the Philadelphia Stars, that is incredible. And by the way, I like how he just casually said that he played basketball in college. He played at uh, Memphis, like he said. But then his senior year, just his senior year, he was like, I'll give football a whirl, professional career. <laughs> like, that's incredible. Uh, so, yeah, he's a fascinating guy. And I'll never forget, you know, every once in a while you put your foot in your mouth, right? I was hosting an event. Again, this is about 10 years ago when 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 uh, Ken and I met. And I was hosting an event, and I'm getting ready to introduce Ken. And I say during – I said this out loud. the uh, From your 1980 Super Bowl uh, NFC champion team, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, they, they, they took the L to the, <laughs> to the Raiders in that one. And Ken – could not have been nicer about it. And he goes up to the um, podium and he goes, yeah, life would have been a little bit different if we wanted, if we would have won that game. Thanks for bringing it up, Mark. And like brings it up funny and sarcastic. Everyone's laughing. And I'm like, you know, sometimes when you get thrown into a moment, I wasn't expecting to host this event. Let me just say that in my own defense. Sometimes you get thrown in a moment. It's just like, Oh God, words, words, or I'm saying words. And ah. we start word vomiting. And that was definitely a, a couple of words. I wish I could have just been like, no, come back. <laughs> and he was just really, really nice. It's not like it was a secret they lost, right? But you didn't need to bring it up at the moment you're introducing a guy as a guest speaker. Anyway, we had talked a little bit before that, um, and he was awesome about it. And by the way, the Jim Mora thing with the playoffs, no, we weren't going to do the playoff rant, but I do want to say this. Jim Mora made money off that playoff rant, man. He made money. Was it Coors Light that sponsored him? For the for his playoffs, right? I was talking to somebody down in New Orleans some years ago and, and got Jim Mora to actually come on the radio and, and do a guest spot. And they were kind of walking him down the line of you know saying playoffs. And I just remember Jim cut the person off and going, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> I'm I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just I'm not gonna say the playoff brand. That's not happening. Uh but anyway, thanks Ken Dunnick for coming on the show. Uh make sure you guys check him out. Uh, Jersey Man Magazine, uh, and uh, some great stuff that he's got going on there. So make sure you guys check out my man Ken uh, at uh, jerseymanmagazine.com. You see it right there at the bottom. So there you go. Uh, let me tell you right now uh, about our friends at PHL Sports Station, Philadelphia Sports Station, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. That's phlsportsstation.com. How about the amazing people at Freestone Farm CBD? Freestonefarmcbd.com. If you like CBD, if you use CBD, if you want to try a different CBD, if you want to try CBD in general, try Freestone Farm CBD at freestonefarmcbd.com. We get 20% off with promo code FARZY. That's 20% off with promo code FARZY at freestonefarmcbd.com. You'll enjoy the tropical tasting Bay Ox, the clocks in it, the chart topping 24.1%, and super CBD, which is half Hindu. Kush. And 21%. Genetics of these guys are off the charts. So enjoy Freestone Farm CBD, freestonefarmcbd.com. Uh, let's get into the chat check today. See how you beautiful people are doing on this fine Tuesday morning. Uh, we got Kevin. What's going on, Kevin? Mally, April, John, John Cheeseburger. Yo, Sandbag Cheeseboro. Yo, Sandbag and SOB. How are you? Sean Gillespie, what's going on? Everyone's saying hello. Everyone's saying hi. It's beautiful. Mally, the man, the myth, the legend. PJ, saying good morning to him. John Cheeser, one of the biggest things that I took away from the San Francisco and Dallas game was that Purdy looked scared when the pressure was there. The Eagles are a much better team with uh, with pressure. That is absolutely true. Absolutely true. However, in that fourth quarter, I thought my man was – my man, what am I saying? I thought the man was money. Um, but uh, I think they're going to go ahead and rock. Brock? Ah. Anyway. Sorry, I'll show myself out. Uh, I believe Gannon will get the Houston job. I think Carolina and Arizona are waiting to realize they're not going to give up a big contract and assets for Peyton. Maybe look at Steichen. It's possible. 
uh john cheeseborough that uh, one more thing as much as i have trust issues with gannon his soft coverages at times the defense has been great very there you go can you can acknowledge that sean gillespie it's crazy all this hoopla over peyton uh here's the deal sean peyton i get i get last paycheck vibes from sean peyton and i like sean peyton i just The idea of the game passing him by, I don't think 100% applies to him. But I just get the sense, like, after you're out of it for a little bit, and then you try to get back into it, especially when you were as great as he was in uh, New Orleans and winning that Super Bowl and being tied at the hip to, to Drew Brees for as long as he was. Like, do you really want? do you really want to get back into it for the long haul? Like, I just get the sense he wants to cast a check. I, I, I don't know if it's because I see him on TV so fast. I don't know what it is. I, the competitive edge is not something I'm looking at Sean Payton any, anymore for. And I know that people are going to back up the truck for him eventually. I just don't get a sense that he comes back and has another 10-year run in him or something like that. I think if he comes back, it's a quick fizzle out. That's my prediction if Sean Payton does take a job. Does get a job, let's say. Uh, Mihai, what's up, Mihai? What's going on? April, sure didn't see any Cowboys fans at work yesterday. They're in deep hiding. April, of course they are. Sean Gillespie, the 2017 team uh, will be made into a movie. It was unbelievable on so many levels. Sean, I don't doubt that. Cowboys fans had a lot to say last week. They did. Mm, they were really talking. They were really talking. Uh, let's see here. What's up? Hey, hey, what's going on? Jalen Hurts beat Brock Purdy in college. And he will beat him in the NFL as well. There you go. Paul Keen from across the ocean. What's going on there, Paul Keen? Random out time. There's been a lot of tries to dismiss the legitimacy of the Eagle season this year. But also, even before the season started, they said, we got to see it on the field. Well, you've seen it on the field. And you got chalk out of this NFC. The number one seed Eagles in the NFC Championship game. The number two seed San Francisco 49ers in the championship game. You got chalk here. And here's the deal. Yes, you can only play who's in front of you. The Cowboys played who was in front of them. They won a playoff game. The Giants played who was in front of them. They won a playoff game. The Eagles beat the Giants. The Cowboys got bounced out against the 49ers. The 49ers are now right in front of the Eagles. If the Eagles smoke the 49ers, let's just play, let's just live in this world for just a second. If the Philadelphia Eagles go out there on Sunday afternoon and pummel the San Francisco 49ers, does that then, I mean, just making it to a Super Bowl, it's crazy to say this, but in those people's eyes that you're referencing there here, uh, who put it out? Was it A? No, it was Random Anton. Random Anton putting out. If you just make it to a Super Bowl, people will say, ah, oh, it's BS because your schedule was crap. Well, if you play the second best team in the conference and you whoop their ass in the conference championship game, does that then legitimize the rest of the season for the doubters? I'm just talking about the doubters here. I'm not talking about the people that watched every snap like you and I for the Philadelphia Eagles this year and went, damn, they are really good. <laughs> it's not just the fact that they got that schedule. It's that they are really good. If you stomp the 49ers, do you then look back at it and go, okay, fine, give us the toughest schedule in all the NFL? We don't give a damn. If you could smoke the Niners, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's some legitimacy. Oh, and also winning the Super Bowl would be kind of awesome, too. <laughs> that, that might help. Making the Super Bowl would be great. Uh, but people, you only made the Super Bowl because your schedule was soft. Only can play who's in front of you. And if you dominate them, that's pretty good for you. That's pretty, pretty, pretty good for you. Uh, Sean Gillespie enjoying the Wilbur Montgomery talk. How could you not? Stars were Philly's only winning major football team for a long time. Sean, yes, they were. <laughs> uh, PJ, I'm not even going to read that aloud. I'm not even going to read that aloud. What the hell? Why not? The Soul had the Phillies winning his team series of billboards in the 19, uh, on 95 near the bridge for about seven months. LOL. Mike Fuji. What's up, Mike Fuji? 
<laughs> Sean Gillespie, the soul actually helped break the Philly curse first. Did they? They didn't win before the uh, Phillies, did they? <laughs> oh, this is great. This is great. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, you guys are great in the chat. Love you as, uh, as per usual. Let's get to the Morning Rush brought to you by Sky Motorcar, SkyMotorcars.com. Uh, we'll get into this more so tomorrow because it will be a game day tomorrow. Tomorrow, the Philadelphia 76ers, who are sitting on a season right now of 30 and 16, will take on the Brooklyn Nets on ESPN at 430. That seems like an early start time. Is my yeah, 430. Uh, they'll take on the Brooklyn Nets. Joel Embiid will take on Ben Simmons. Oh, goody. Uh, the Brooklyn Nets, by the way, 29 and 17 on the season. Uh, once again, Philadelphia 30 and 16 on the year. Flyers, they're back on the ice. Uh, tonight, 4 o'clock against the L.A. Kings. They're hosting the Kings tonight. Uh, Flyers uh, have uh, split their last two games, or last four games, excuse me, uh, two and two. But uh, they haven't lost back-to-back -back games in quite some time, which is a nice little thing there for the Philadelphia Flyers. Look forward to them uh, continuing uh, to build in trend in the right direction. Uh, although I am with most people that just want them to tank and be terrible to continue to get better draft picks. So hopefully that'll actually happen. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. It's been the Farzy Show presented by Steven Singer of Steven Singer Jewelers. One place, one price, perfect price online at iatstevensinger.com. That's iatstevensinger.com. Jim Hyder produced the program, did a wonderful job as per usual. John Burchard, Bell the Bird podcast, will join us tomorrow to talk all things Eagles. And John's also a man for all seasons. We'll talk some hoops as well. Thanks, everybody. This is a Buzz Sports Entertainment production. My name is Mark Farzad. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Talk to you guys tomorrow. See ya.